hear from our from our three current speakers. Um, and the format's basically going to be each person's going to talk for about 10 to 15 minutes on a pre, um, I gave them a preset template of questions uh, to kind of kind of do a quick high level overview of how they got to where they are today. And at the end, we'll have questions and you'll know, have time for questions and answers. So um, to get us started here, I'm going to switch over to Dean and turn on his slideshow. And I'm going to introduce and say, turn it over to Dean Bonner there to tell us a little bit about yourself, Dean. Sure enough. Yes. Um, so my name is Dean. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm a research fellow as well as an, the associate survey director of the statewide survey at the Public Policy Institute of California. Um, I'm one of the few associate survey directors, but we also happen to have John Cohen, who was in his prior life, a, um, the associate survey director of the survey. Um, my day-to-day -day work includes, you know, a lot of prep for upcoming surveys, whether it be researching topics, questionnaire designs, um, as well as um, administrative tasks. We often um, apply for grants to, to get funding to do work. Um, I'm handling a lot of the kind of, uh, I don't have a administrator, so to speak, so I handle a lot of invoices and kind of the, uh, the not so cool aspects of things. And then I also work on kind of, um, you know, research projects and blogs as well. And in addition to being a, a, uh, a researcher at PPIC, I serve on numerous working groups um, that we have, as well as um, mentoring my younger colleagues that, um, that we have at the Institute and on the survey team. So next slide, yes. <clears throat> So as the associate survey director, what I'm currently doing is trying to get set up for next year. We kind of completed our final survey of the year in November, and now we're trying to decide, you know, what we're going to do methodologically, um, whether we should increase cell phone usage, whether we should go to maybe some ABS techniques. Um, and next year, we're really excited. Uh, you know, we'll have our 18th annual survey on education, our 19th annual survey on the environment, our third annual survey on economic well-being, um, and those are all done online using the Ipsos Knowledge Panel. Additionally, we'll have uh, probably five RDD surveys that will look at uh, the governor's race as well as kind of politics and policy issues that are. Um, that are bubbling up in the capital. Um, I'm also a research fellow. Um, and so my work as a fellow includes, you know, collaborating with other researchers on topics. You know, last year I put out a report with some economists, which was really interesting to work with those guys uh, on income inequality. I have some work uh, coming up, hopefully on political participation, potentially something looking at, uh, at Latino voters in California and, well, this is kind of my second job, so to speak, because my first job is associate survey director. It, it really provides me with the opportunity to do things I never would kind of work on if I was just working with surveys. So I'm able to, you know, work with these economists or work with people at the water center to do a blog or whatnot. And so um, it, it really provides a little bit of uh, variability in the work that I do. Outside of work, some of my passions, you know, I, I love to cook, um, used to love to travel. I guess that'll happen again sometimes. Uh, as my wife can attest, I love watching sports. Um, less reading nowadays, but uh, one thing, I, I guess it's a passion. You're kind of forced to do it, but it's parenting. Um, I have two kids, a four-year-old and a six-year-old, and so that really does, uh, um, you really have to be passionate about it sometimes because they can be challenging, so. Next slide. Uh, so as far as my uh, education, you know, I have a, uh, a BA in political science and history at uh, Cal State Fullerton. Um, I was able to get that during my first tenure out here in California. I'm originally from Louisiana. And so I moved out here in 97 and spent probably until 2000, graduated and then went back to Louisiana. And at that point, I was really trying to decide what I wanted to do. You know, I had this degree, but really no clue about what I was going to do. And that's kind of uh, a big part of my story um, because I'm, I just, I, I took a path that's probably not the standard path. 
Um, and so I ended up going to the University of New Orleans and getting my master's and then my PhD in political science, studying a wide array of things. At one point I thought I was gonna do a dissertation on uh, the democratization of China. Um, realized that probably learning the Chinese language was gonna be more challenging than I thought. And so then I kind of, uh, my fallback plan was to become Americanist and it seemingly has served me fairly well. Um, beyond the organization that I work at, uh, PPIC, you know, I really do love A4 and Pay4 and, um, and think that these organizations that really do a lot for, um, for us as a, as a uh, group of folks doing all, all doing the same thing. So some of the more pivotal moments, this was kind of challenging because I, you know, I've been at the same job for, you know, most of my kind of career. But I really do think that becoming a graduate student, it's not something I ever really thought I was gonna be. I probably, when I was growing up, I thought I was just gonna be a, you know, a high school teacher, maybe, you know, do some coaching and, and really didn't have a uh, real idea of what I wanted to do. And so I began, you know, I, I graduated high school in 89. Then I graduated, uh, um, my undergrad in 99, and then I ended up finishing at University of New Orleans in 2009. And so I often tell younger folks, like, it's not about the, it's, it's less about how long it takes you to get somewhere, and it's more about how you get there, you know, and, and getting there, of course. Um, and during my time as a graduate student, I was given the opportunity to work as a survey research center, uh, survey research associate at the Survey Research Center. Um, and they had been doing a lot of work on politics and whatnot, but I was hired specifically for a, uh, a special topic survey, surveys that they were gonna do um, in 2004 on hurricane uh, evacuation behavior. And so these, this was going to be a study of 12 different counties or parishes, I should say, in southeastern Louisiana. And just, you know, asking them a broad array of questions about past behavior, future behavior, some of the impediments to evacuation. And it all became really, well, two points in time. One was that during one of our fielding periods, there was actually a hurricane. And so we were able to really kind of, you know, come back with folks that we had talked to and ask them what they actually did for this most recent storm. But, you know, we put out data in for the Orleans County uh, survey, you know, presented it to FEMA, presented it to numerous folks around the city, um, that basically there were probably going to be about 100,000 people that wouldn't have a way to leave New Orleans if there was going to be a major storm. And so, and then less than a year later, there's Katrina and it just, uh, and I left New Orleans two weeks prior to Katrina to move to San Francisco to be with my now wife, no job or anything. And, uh, and so that was really a surreal moment when kind of my research kind of, you know, uh, basically bared true and in a very sad way, uh, you know, when, when Hurricane Katrina uh, happened. And so I arrived in San Francisco and uh, I become a research associate at the Public Policy Institute of California, really had no knowledge of the organization before I applied, really didn't know a whole lot about it. I was just kind of just trying to figure out what I was going to do, right? Applying for adjunct teaching positions, applying for probably some market research positions. I think I uh, at one point was like, I can just, I work, have a history in restaurant management, going that route, and then I get this job. Basically, thanks to uh, my boss, Mark Baldessari, as a sociologist, had a relationship a uh, number of years back working with my boss at the Survey Research Center at UNO, and my kind of name popped for him and, and ended up getting this job. And then in 2014, I became the Associate Survey Director, which of course um, has really led me professionally to a position where I'm managing people. I am uh, really kind of um, running a team of four people, but you know my boss is the president and CEO, so it's kind of a little bit siloed. Where I'm kind of uh, me and my two other colleagues do a 
a lot of the work kind of um, at this level and it's brought up to uh, Mark where kind of all the kind of final decisions are made. So that was a really big step. And I guess another one would be when I became a research fellow, I think in 2018 or something, because that allows me to kind of broaden the amount of work that I can do. Next slide. So I really wish, you know, some of the things I wish I had more time to talk about were, of course, my, my two wonderful kids. The idea of analyzing panel data as we've started using this Ipsos knowledge panel. So we have folks that have answered our education survey for multiple years and our well-being survey. Um, I'm from Louisiana. I'm from a part of Louisiana called Acadiana. Um, so I'm technically a Cajun. Um, um, PPIC is a great organization because besides for the survey, which is really well known, we do a lot of work outside that realm on the economy, on the, on, on, uh, the water situation in California, on higher education. Um, the idea of, of hurricane preparedness is, is really something that I've kind of stuck with me. I've done some work on disaster preparedness out here in California, looking at kind of uh, how Californians view the preparedness for themselves and the and the and the and the uh and the state and, and local governments um really the importance of dialogue is something that I've, especially i think the pandemic which in some ways that was taken away from us um and so th that's really important pandemic also got me into family biking which i never biked before and now all of a sudden i have this 70 pound behemoth that i'm you know bringing kids all over the city um and one of the things that Bob and I kind of joked about is the idea of the, the things that you hear while you're monitoring phone surveys for data collection. Um, really interesting. Uh, if, you, if you haven't had the chance to do it, you should try to do it. Or if you can't, then you should talk to people who have because it's, it's really a, a eye-opening experience to hear what people um, actually say. And I would suggest, you know, I have volunteered for PayPal in the past. I've been uh, the mini conference chair. And I hope once you know my life becomes a little more stable with these kids that uh, I can get back to it um, because it really was fulfilling. Um, so as I said, my journey isn't necessarily the standard four years of college, whatever for master's, PhD, whatever. It really has been a journey, and it's really taught me that you know time is time is not linear. It's something that you know you just it's a it's a journey. So just enjoy it. Um, Ideally, you all can find work that's meaningful and hopefully you can do it with people that you like because um, working with someone that you don't like or doing work that's just work isn't really fun. Um, relationships really matter professionally, personally. So really do what you can to foster them, especially during this time. And I think, you know, don't be afraid to reach out for others, whether it be for like, hey, I'm doing this new survey design I've never done before. Um, or, you know, just asking questions about things or just in the need to, you know, connect with someone because I think we've all learned that during the pandemic, the idea of, of, of being disconnected from your, your kind of peer group is really challenging. And so make sure to take care of yourself and reach out to others if, if you need it. And, um, and lastly, just thank you for listening. I will say that this picture is actually from uh, it's in San Francisco. So if you live in the Bay Area and you haven't been to the botanical gardens here in the city, which is probably a stone's throw, literal stone's throw from where I'm sitting. I have a pretty good arm though. So, you know, um, definitely consider, you know, going out there and checking out because you can really just lose yourself. This is the Redwood Grove and you would never know that you were in the middle of San Francisco when you visit there. So, um, and here's all my contact information and and Twitter handles. So thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, Dean. Appreciate that. Um, a little, I said, there'll be time for questions at the end. You can either talk to them in the chat or actually, you know, bring them up when raising your hand. Um, Aaron, did you raise your hand for a reason or you just want to show how you could raise your hand? Just clapping. Oh, That's good, all. clapping. Okay, good. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. Um, now we're going to hand it, go up to John. And uh, John, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Thank you, Bob. Hi, Aaron. Let me put it back on a different view for myself so I can see people. Uh, Dean, is $100 million too much to pay for a college football coach? Nope. Okay, got it. I'll ask the rest about to save the balance of my questions for the end. Um, I am the chief research officer and uh, run partnerships at Momentive, 
which until three months ago or four months ago or five months ago, I lose track of time. As Dean says, it's not linear. Um, we were known as SurveyMonkey, which is an organization I joined um, you know, most immediately from the Pew Research Center where I was for a half a second after a career that I'll get into at the Washington Post and ABC News. And I've bundled those together since that's a singular polling unit, although they are multiple uh, jobs for me. But I've been at this for a long time. Dean talked about how I got into it at first at PPIC, but I will um, go to that. My job currently, and many of you have hopefully, if you tuned into the conference before now, and I'm sorry I wasn't able to join the last two days, have heard from my colleagues, uh, some of whom I see them here um, who've been presenting. We've tried really hard to you know, take this behemoth that is SurveyMonkey that was founded in 1999 and was rather disruptive and perceived as disruptive to a, potentially a lot of your businesses into a, you know, kind of how do we take the massive amount of data that we have accumulated over 22 years now and use it for the public good, at least in terms of the survey research land. So we worked really hard to work with APOR and PAYPOR um, in presenting data and making sure that the data we collect uh, get out there and help uh, move the industry forward because I'm sure we can all agree that it needs to move forward. Uh, rather rapidly. So kind of I work on a number of things. I've been at Momentive now for nearly eight years. I think I'm a month away from my eighth, eighth year anniversary uh, there and kind of have led teams over time that kind of try to harness all the data that we collect. And we collect, you know, billions of responses um, every week um, into something that, you know, kind of is useful for the millions of people who use SurveyMonkey. Although we changed our name, SurveyMonkey lives on as our flagship product. And you know, right, a lot of the tools that we've built that make surveys easier for people to uh, design, implement, and analyze. You know, now we call them AI and ML based, rightly, and that is how you have to advertise things these days. But they all started with plain old research, and most of that research started uh, from some of my colleagues who are on this call, some alumna like Aaron and others who are, are not here. But we kind of tried to build that up over time. We've also I have a media background that I'll get to in a little bit. Um, previewed earlier. We've also kind of created and, you know, kind of curate relationships with the top tier media that is just a way to showcase what we can do and how important it is to put data alongside their most important editorial projects. And so have a, a long string of those over the eight years kind of building on uh, my prior experience. My passions outside of work, um, I asked my kids this question. Um, on the way out the door and thankfully they didn't say staring at my phone or working a lot, which they might have in other circumstances um, uh, strung on me. They gave me uh, playing, coaching my daughter softball team, which has been a wonderful thing to do over the last uh, couple of years, you know, particularly during the pandemic and playing catch with my son and doing little league stuff. So, and family travel, and I'll look forward to your tips in the, in the Q and A. Um, what I'd add is I've been on a bit of a, a mindset kick. Um, you know, growth mindset is something that you know, we try to instill in not only employees at you know growth-minded companies like the one I work for currently, uh, but also from parenting. And Dean mentioned earlier the, the challenges of parenting. Those don't go away, Dean, sorry. Um, but the, they, 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 do, they do change. And kind of this idea of what a mindset means you know, for children as they age and for us as adults, I think we're all adults on this call as, as, as we age, is an important one and one that I've spent a lot of time on. The pandemic was an opportunity to read even more than I had before um, and, you know, kind of listen to a lot of podcasts. So ask me anything. You can, you can click ahead. My, my educational background, I put in here my high school only because some of you may be from the area. I did grow up in Berkeley and went to high school in Oakland uh, before going east for college. Uh, my mother always described people who grew up in, in Berkeley, as I was lucky to, enough to do, as boomerang babies, you know, they throw us east for school and then we just come flipping on back. I then threw myself back for a, a job and I came flipping on back. So, you know, kind of that's, that's, that's where we've been. I'm currently living in Palo Alto, which is a city I grew up despising um, for Stanford reasons primarily, but just for suburban reasons more generally. Uh, I have learned after eight years of living here that I was the problem, not Palo Alto, but that's you know a life stage thing probably too. Um, organizations I love, APOR and PAYPOR. Bob, thank you for putting those in the deck. I didn't take them out because I believe wholly in them, as well as the other two chapters that I belong to. I am a you know registered coach at USA Softball, which is a girls softball organization, a wonderful one. 
in the Palo Alto Little League. I put in here bananas for those of you who are from the East Bay. My, my late mother co-founded an organization called Bananas uh, in the early 70s. There were a, a group of women, my mother had a, a master's in social work um, and she was among them who were being driven crazy um, by their children, yours truly included, and started a resource and referral organization called Bananas that still exists today um, and kind of created the first, what was a warm line in California. You all know crisis hotlines that exist for many serious important things. The warm line was there's a daily crisis when it comes to parenting. Um, as we can test with, you know, kind of parents on here can all attest to and having a place to call and resources to um, turn to when those crises evolve, include, including not sleeping, et cetera. They created that. There's now a series in all of the 58 California counties of resource and referral uh, agencies that are linked together and providing subsidized child care. So that's an organization that has um, stayed near and dear to my heart um, for many, many years now. And I'd put on organizations I love almost everywhere I work, but I'll I won't reveal. Uh, I, I, Bob, I did add the word professional here because I don't think we have time to go through uh, pivotal moments in my life, nor is this necessarily the appropriate forum to um, explore those. But um, my, my kind of, I put in here my first job out of college. I was a history major. I focused on 19th and 20th century American history. And I got hired for, by Anderson Consulting. That's a, a name that may not be familiar to younger generations, but that's now known as Accenture. They did a rebrand. I, I mentioned my own, our own re, company rebrand. Accenture did when Anderson, you know, really messed things up on the accounting side. Even though it was a different company, they felt they should change their name, and they were probably right to do it. I got hired as a systems analyst, even though I had no coding background. I was sent to a, a training facility outside Chicago that still exists for anyone other Anderson or Accenture alums here, and I was taught to program in COBOL which is a language that even at the time only existed for major you know, government contracts and uh, you know, defense organizations still exists for those, but not anywhere else. It was, I had no experience. I learned how to do it. I was sent at the time you know, to you know, state governments. I worked in Annapolis for the state of Maryland. I worked in Nashville for the state of Tennessee. And the only thing you got credit for in that line of work is still mostly true today is having your butt in the seat. And so working 16 to 18 hour days, you know, coding, I will say, and I'll get to this in, in the wrap up later in terms of, uh, you know, kind of what you should, what I would, what I recommend to people who are interested in exploring new things is like, I had no idea that coding would be as influential, you know, for me um, as it has, as it became when I did it. I did it because I had a life philosophy that was, uh, inflicted on me on a conversation I had with a professor uh, one summer in Poland that it didn't matter what I did uh, between the age graduation and four or five years after and I should just do a wide variety of things that I found interesting and that I you know kind of put me in a, a position to make a better decision when I had more uh, when I had to make a better decision later in my 20s as it were um, but the, I, I since revised that to my 30s and 40s. But the idea was I never would have taken the job at Accenture if I thought I was doing it for my career. I did it for an experience. It turned out I learned coding that had that made me demonstrably more successful as a pollster, you know, kind of in every subsequent job. I then went to graduate school at Berkeley, and I, I should rewrite this now that I see Tom Piazza here. Um, so nice to see you, Tom, but, you know, kind of, I, I will say the work that you, you, know, you all know that there's a whole lot of drudgery in surveys. I'm not complaining, Tom, it was super helpful, but, you know, kind of coding, you know, kind of doing old code books from field polls, actually, Mark, um, that were, you know, stored at UC data way back when, you know, kind of, but the early efforts at digitizing, you know, a lot of things, you know, kind of, I, I learned how to do that from my, you know, coding state tax systems. I learned that it took patience. I learned that, you know, kind of the reward, you know, wasn't immediately apparent and you had to kind of enjoy the process of, you know, kind of the, you know, the articulation of the goals, the putting in of the data, and then ultimately having, you know, analytical capability that no one else had because they hadn't done that digitization work. So my, I, I went to grad school, it was in the first dot-com boom, so all my friends were making money and having fun. And I was sitting in the Bancroft Library, you know, intent on increasing the world's knowledge by a millimeter or two. So I left um, to run in startup land for a while. 
when 9-11 happened, I wanted to do something, um, what I felt was just kind of deeper and more core to my academic um, values. And I got the job at PPIC. And so, you know, kind of at the time, it was a quarterly survey. Mark Baldessari, who's already been uh, mentioned on this call, was running it as a quarterly survey. I joined full time, made it a monthly survey and kind of built some of the systems uh, that, you know, kind of were in place for many years after. I hope they aren't still. Um, but if they are, I'm sure they work great. Okay. Um, did that, moved to New York. I put in here the ABC, Washington Post ABC News poll. At the time I moved to New York, I called it the ABC News Washington Post poll because I worked at ABC News and that's, that's, what, that's what we did. Um, I was the associate director there, assistant director there to Gary Langer, um, which was a trial by fire on lots of counts, but a, a wonderful experience. Uh, continued to work very hard, ended up moving to the Washington Post um, as its director of polling and polling editor in 06 and worked, you know, every day for 80 days and finally got a break and, you know, got to hire a couple people uh, on, on, onto the team. I worked briefly at the Pew Research Center, um, but when uh, Bezos bought the Washington Post, uh, Dave Goldberg, who had been a board member of the Washington Post company, whose announcement as a board member sent shutters through me because I was doing very expensive, you know, probability, telephone probability polling. And we'd moved into cell phones as Dean talked about and done it all. And I didn't use SurveyMonkey, nor would I in our editorial work. And so when Dave joined the board, I, I was a little more, more, more than a little apprehensive, but he became a terrific mentor to me. Um, he was, you know, interested in how we can make this industry thrive for the long term, not just for you know kind of the months and one election ahead. And so he became a mentor. And when Bezos bought the post, Dave um, started convincing me that the way to think about the future of the survey business, not just the company, was to make the move. And I so I did that, um, decided to do that, and started right at the beginning of 2014. I wish I had more time to talk about things I want to pull about. I, in my job, I don't get to do much of that. Um, I probably do it annoyingly to my team at the, after they've already decided what to do and come in late with some ideas. But I really miss the substance of this. We talk so much about the methodology and changing methodology. I, I, I would like there to be a day when we have greater consensus among ourselves about what makes good surveys so we can start talking about um, the interesting results and there are a whole lot of incredibly important things happening in the country and in the world that I'd like to um, understand substantively, not just under, you know, debating the math of it. Um, but related to that, I want to talk about what's next for polling because I think there has to be a bright future because, and we just have to will it and create it and work hard to get it because it's too important to F up. Um, also, I, you know, I mentioned the self-help the stuff that I've been doing around mindset and kind of been super intrigued by, you know, kind of why, you know, why we eat so poorly um, as, as a society. And so I've spent a lot of time on that. Um, I can talk, talk ad nauseum about it. Um, my wife would immediately mute me um, <laughs> if she could even hear, hear me say that, um, but she's listened to it. And I'd love to talk about the best trips to take um, with the kids before they, before they leave. And that, that happens fast. And again, they're nine and 10 but um, we've taken some great trips, um, including this past August, uh, but really eager to do that. And family travel's a, a passion. Uh, take th three things away. Um, get new skills whenever possible. Um, never assume you'll know when and how they'll be useful to you. I mentioned my COBOL, like still useful. You know, learning how to program, doesn't matter if it's SPSS, SAS, R, like having those skills, um, you know, will always come in handy and you never know when. Uh, just don't be an asshole I, I, yeah. and just don't be an asshole. Um, and one thing that's been particularly relevant in, to me um, in the past six months um, is it's never the idea that it's never over. Like you, you just, it's just never over. Like there's no, there's nothing, I mean, I'm not getting too existential. There's an end, sorry. But <laughs> like, like in terms of like, there's no competition with another company there's no, you know, kind of, you know, kind of storyline that has a, a kind of a final end point. There's always another chapter to write and you're in charge. Thank you. And this is the trip that I took to Alaska in August, which is a wonderful time to go to Alaska. And we took a copter up to a glacier and my kids are distant enough here to not be hurting each other, but they are throwing snowballs at one another. 
Great. Thanks, John. Appreciate that. Um, and again, it'll be time for questions at the end. And uh, we're going to turn it over to Mark here, who's going to be our, our third speaker here. Again, we did these alphabetically, and it's amazing that someone with the last name of D is the third speaker. I was, that's how my brain works. But um, Mark, why don't you get us started? Thanks a lot, guys. Um, interesting stuff, you, 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 the two uh, previous speakers. Uh, I've been polling in California my whole career, although I never had been to California before I uh, had a job interview with Mervyn Field. So uh, my life really changed when uh, I got a call. I was at Cornell Graduate School at the time uh, from Mervyn Field and basically saying, you know, I'm interested in your resume, your background. If you're ever in California, I'd love to talk to you. So I had to work my way West Coast to uh, get there. And uh, as a struggling student, it was kind of a creative process. I won't go into it, but I, I ended up getting there and uh, ended up, he hired me, which was uh, an amazing thing and uh, worked for Merv directly. He was the chairman and CEO of Field Research Corporation. I was kind of the assistant director of the field poll uh, until uh, he decided to retire in 1993. And I then became the director uh, and held, held that position for uh, 25 years um, until Field uh, was no more. During, during my entire tenure at Field, I also, I would say more than half of my time was spent uh, on the corporation side. I ended up being the senior vice president at Field. Uh, I directed large scale studies uh, for lots of different entities, academic institutions, foundations, government agencies, businesses. It was the full scale uh, kind of marketing research, but I was kind of the focus was more on the policy side, public policy, did lots of interesting studies, even went back to Three Mile Island uh, to do a survey of people. This is really dating me uh, uh, after the Three Mile Island accident because uh, Bechtel hired Field to find out Kind of get some inside inside information about what uh, the public around Three Mile Island was thinking at the t right after the accident. It was just an incredible survey. I mean, I'd love to share that with you, but it wasn't a publicly released study. Um, stayed at Field my entire forty year career, uh, and then uh, at the end of the uh, Field sojourn, I fortunately. Uh, bumped into Jack Citrin, who was the Institute of Governmental Studies director, whom I had known for many, many years. In fact, one of the first surveys of the field poll that I did back in 1978 was done in conjunction with Jack Citrin. He was uh, researching uh, things about Proposition 13, which had just passed, and he ended up writing a book about it, but we worked together in doing some post-Proposition uh, 13 surveys. Uh, he went on to make a, you know, a, a real career of understanding and, and reporting on taxation, but he was one of the first people that I knew at Berkeley. And uh, you know, at the end of my career, he became very influential in bringing me to Berkeley, basically saying, Mark, why don't you just, uh, since there's no more field poll, why don't you just take on the Berkeley IGS poll uh, and uh, make it better and uh, take it uh, to the next level. So uh, I really appreciate uh, that transition from Jack. Uh, you know, throughout my career, I've been heavily uh, uh, just tracking voter opinions uh, on everything. I mean, in, in California, uh, this past year kind of took me by surprise because I thought it was going to be an off presidential election year when in fact, it ended up being a huge year in California with the big national media spotlight on the gubernatorial recall of Gavin Newsom. Uh, we've been working with the LA Times the last two or three years as our media partner that should continue now into uh, the 2022 elections. I'm looking forward uh, to the statewide elections and one interesting sidebar of working with the LA Times, uh, they also want me to poll uh, in the LA mayoral election, which will be an interesting challenge. Uh, I think the methodology that we use uh, at, uh, PP at the IGS poll lends itself well uh, to doing that, and it, it'll be an interesting challenge. I'm looking forward to that as well. So in addition to doing statewide polls, we'll be tracking uh, opinions about who uh, the next mayor of Los Angeles will be for the LA Times. Uh, I've been a lifelong golfer all my life. Uh, I was on the Harvard golf team uh, in college. I was a pretty good golfer back then. I've struggled since then, but I'm still playing. 
Uh, I'm a 35 year member of the Olympic Club, which is a really fine uh, golf course, if you don't know it, in San Francisco. Uh, I continue to play with my buddies on a regular basis. It's one of the uh, advantages of now being uh, kind of uh, semi-employed by uh, Berkeley. It's not a full-time position for me. Uh, I get to go out on the golf course probably twice a week, and I still do it and enjoy it. Uh, I spend a lot of time with my, uh, my wife and our family, who fortunately for me uh, live nearby. I live in Mill Valley. They also live in Mill Valley. They had two kids. My, my daughter and her husband. So I see the grandkids uh, regularly and that's a, that's a great uh, joy for both of us. Okay, my educational background, I mentioned I went to Harvard, uh, got an M, uh, a BA cum laude in 1975. My major uh, was uh, social relations. Uh, and uh, much like uh, the previous two speakers, I kind of graduated from college not knowing exactly what my career path would be. I was kind of all over the lot in studying at Harvard. I thought it was a great undergraduate education, uh, but it was very much a generalist education. And uh, I thought about maybe law school, but uh, decided against that and uh, took a year off between uh, 1975 and 1976 to just uh, ponder what I would uh, like to do. And uh, after spending quite a bit of time at uh, uh, oh, uh, different libraries and just understanding how people, uh, you know, listening to people talk about their own careers. A lot of these were just tapes that were recorded uh, talking about what they do in their jobs. Uh, I realized that, you know, my, my long suit in, in, in terms of academics uh, is really uh, the technical aspect. I'm, I should have been an engineer. I'm really good at, uh, or always have been good at math and the technical sides of things. But my passion, my interests were in uh, public, uh, the public affairs and public arena. So uh, the polling aspect really intrigued me. And so at the time I thought that's where I'd like to go. That's how I'd uh, like to position myself. So I applied to uh, the graduate school at Cornell uh, with the idea of getting an education to become a pollster. I mean, this is an MBA, so certainly it trained me to become a marketing researcher, uh, but I moved outside of the school itself to take on classes in government and city and regional planning and so on to broaden my experience and to get the kind of background that I needed uh, to do uh, polling uh, outside of uh, once I graduated. And that served me well. Uh, and again, my resume uh, or at least my introductory letter to, to field organization was that, look, I'm here. Uh, I can help you on the business side by doing marketing research. And, uh, but my real interest is in, in doing public opinion polling and uh, be happy to uh, combine those skills into one job. And uh, Mervyn Field had that job at the time. So it was a good marriage for him and for me. And I, I, I really think that's uh, uh, really been my life uh, change, the biggest pivotal moment in my life. Uh, certainly the organizations, uh, APOR was really pivotal to me in my early years. Uh, I went to just about every APOR conference uh, since I started at Fields uh, 1978 for the next 30 years, I would say. Um, and I think that's really important to kind of get to know your peers, get to know kind of the state of the art. Uh, at the time, polling was pretty much uh, done uh, using a certain methodology, RDD, random digit dialing was the method. Uh, and, uh, you know, just refining your skills and knowing the knowledge and, and, and information about uh, what the, what's going, what's the latest in the industry was important to me. Uh, the APOR served me really well. Now that I'm at Berkeley, however, I'm really interested in what my colleagues around me are doing. Uh, and I'm amazed at uh, the talent that's at Berkeley and its faculty and I have two graduate students who work for me directly and I, my God, I've got the best educated uh, assistants that I've ever had. Uh, you know, these people are mostly on the PhD track to become full professors at major universities and they help out me on the polling side and I really benefit from their knowledge and skill and interest. Okay, the pivotal moments of my career, um, certainly the year off that I spent between college and graduate school really paid off because I really made a good life career path choice, which was to get into the field of public opinion research and polling. Uh, the call that I got from Irvin Field when I was at Cornell 
uh, really blew me away because when Mervyn Field said he was on the line, I had no idea. I was actually speaking to the Mervyn Field, the chairman and you know, well-known pollster in California. I thought it was his son. I, why would the chairman be calling me? I'm just a lowly grad student, but uh, uh, he had a personal interest in me and uh, encouraged me to get out west to meet with him, and I did, and uh, the rest was history. Uh, I was then named after many years at Field, and you know, one of the things that I really uh, appreciate from Field was the staff that Mervyn Field had uh, had really assembled around him. He really sought out excellent people, marketing researchers, uh, VPs. Uh, we even had a, a statistician on board, Peter Sherrill, who was from Stanford. He was wonderful. Learning from these people and working for them at a, in my early part of the career was really beneficial to me. Uh, and I, I, it, that took me to another level. And again, with the APOR people outside of the company, I really benefited from that on a technical basis. Uh, and then I became director of the field poll. It was great. I enjoyed it. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger was, uh, you know, becoming the uh, new governor. And, uh, and there was an international interest in his uh, becoming governor. Uh, so that was a great period during the, my tenure at, at a field. Um, and at, actually, that 2013 isn't correct. It was actually, I think, 19... Uh, 93, I became director of the field poll. Anyways, uh, at the end of the field's uh, organization's uh, tenure, then uh, I became the director at Berkeley. That was the next uh, big step in my career. And I've been there ever since and have really enjoyed the five years. Uh, this will be the fifth year uh, coming year uh, that I've been there. Uh, what I'd like to talk about outside of my work, and I can con uh, confirm with John that I certainly love to talk about the future of polling and methodologies that are important uh, to ke keep it, this industry moving forward. I think we're stumbling onto one just for election polling at, uh, at the Berkeley IGS poll that's been working quite well, which is new and unique. Uh, I think there are many ways that research will be moving forward in the future, uh, and I, I like the ability uh, of the kind of breaking ground in one of them. So I encourage others to think creatively about how you go about doing research in this current environment. But outside of research, sports has been great. I mean, for me, I've, I'm a huge follower of professional sports, the San Francisco Giants, the Golden State Warriors, and they've been so successful in recent years without really uh, many people expecting them to do so, especially the Giants. Uh, and I used to have season tickets with my wife and go to the Giants games when Barry Bonds was there. And then when they won the World Series and stuff, that was just remarkable to me. But golf has really been the center of my uh, life outside of work uh, for all these years. It keeps me sane. Uh, you get to walk around a golf course. It's almost like walking around a park for five hours, four or five hours. and clears out your head and you know it's something I enjoy doing and uh, really it's it's a mind game you, if you uh, think you can do it well uh, and you have some uh, skill at it uh, that's really what uh, what will drive uh, your success all right three things uh, that I just advise people as they uh, get through their careers is get to know and, and learn from the others in your profession uh, those who you admire uh, especially in your early years as you're kind of learning your craft. That really was the key for me. Uh, it really served me well now that I'm kind of further down in my career. I, I have the confidence in myself that I think I have a solid basis of knowing how to go about doing polls, uh, the sampling that's involved, the weighting that's involved. I, I really enjoy that kind of technical aspect of polling. I, I, I think of myself more as a methodologist than really somebody who's out front and loving to talk about the results of their poll. I, I enjoy the kind of the back room of it all as well. Uh, try to build and maintain a public persona of your own, one that you feel comfortable with. Uh, I think that's been important for me. I've been a spokesperson for the field poll for many, many years. Uh, and now I'm a spokesperson for the Berkeley IGS poll. I think I've kind of carved out a little niche in California politics. I enjoy it and I feel comfortable talking about it. Uh, re remain active and, and stay connected with others, both in your professional and in your personal life. That'll serve you well. Uh, you never know who you're gonna bump into uh, as these others uh, have told you uh, uh, that will influence your life down the road. And I agree with John, don't be an asshole to other people. 
that's about it. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, I'm at Berkeley. Certainly send me an email if you like. Uh, all of the work, one great thing about the Berkeley poll is all the work that we publish is all online. Everything is available, the tabs, the reports. Uh, so I get to you know, talk about and look back on all of my work. Uh, and also the, the work of the field poll is all archived there, as John said. So uh, a lot of my career is kind of uh, settled into the Berkeley campus and, and that's a great thing for me. Thanks very much. Great, thanks everybody. Now, if, if you all wouldn't mind, let's let's unturn or turn on your cameras so we can have a kind of like as John said, see some familiar, friendly faces. I'm gonna actually uh, remove the spotlights from from us so we can kind of all see each other. Um, and then, as I said, we're gonna go to uh, any questions that you might have for anyone here. I have a few as well, but I want to kind of see if anyone can unmute and ask yourself ask questions. And I can use the raise hand feature if you'd like. But while, so while you're figuring that out, I'll, I'll ask one here. We've talked a lot about uh, get to know people. Dean, you've talked about your mentorship. Mark, we, all these learnings we've talked about is really getting to know people and the importance of networking. Um, for those who are newer in the industry, what advice do you give to you know, maybe a graduate student to how to go ahead and take that leap to reach out to someone? What, what advice do any of you have for that? I'd say go to the conferences, certainly. Um, uh, you know, <coughs> professional conferences are where most of these people gather uh, and bump into people at, you know, informal settings. Uh, cocktail parties are good. Golf courses always serve me well. Uh, whatever you're comfortable doing, uh, you know, get yourself in a setting where you're comfortable and uh, pick these people's brains. Great. I would say just, just, just do it. I mean, show up. I mean, you know, offer to have a cup of coffee, you know, go somewhere to go to a different city. And I can remember imposing myself on Kathy Frankovic. Nice to see you, Kathy. Yeah, in New York, um, you know, just like I was in New York and Kathy would like, have lunch with me and it was amazing. And I loved it. And it meant a lot for me um, early in my career. Um, not to impose much more lunch dates on you, Kathy, but I, I did benefit tremendously from it. Um, we never worked together, but it was it was a huge um, benefit to me. So just ask. I mean, the worst that happens is someone doesn't have time. I think the challenge is we all live in this world now. I, you know, kind of it's harder for me to construct those relationships and those connections over Zoom. And it's so I found it to be a, a big struggle and, you know, eager to get back in, in person. But, you know, so I, I'm not sure in the hybrid world how to create, you know, kind of the same level of, you know, just like I'm not it's not transactional. It's just kind of, hey, can we connect and, and you know, just get to go know one another and shoot the shit. Great. Dean? I would just say, yeah, just reach out because most of the people in the profession are are, are really kind and nice and would be willing to help. Um, and so, you know, just just do it, as John said, and, you know, just most people are uh, asking. My only caveat is not everyone's nice, but like, <laughs> that's okay. That just doesn't mean you shouldn't ask. <laughs> Great. Yeah, and, and on the other side, this we're talking about networking there, but also many of you will have uh, people applying for jobs out there. There's been several jobs posted in the Whova uh, app website we have here where, you know, NRC, Kaiser Family Foundation, Harris are all posting jobs there. When you get, um, a, a job application, what are the skills that you look for? What are the things that you're looking for in, as, as so you were to add someone to your team? I mean, I think in, in today's age, I'm looking for someone that, that, that has the skills, the coding skills, the, the kind of skills that would be able to move your company forward, right? Because you're not you just don't want someone who can do what you're currently doing. Ideally, you're finding someone who can do the things that you want to do, and that can you know pull you along. I mean, as a I'm not as old as, as some folks, but I do feel like you know someone who can bring some youth and kind of bring you forward. And 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 as always, just you know someone with that can write good, because I think that's a skill that is often just you know you get some some cover letters or some some writing examples, and you're just like whoo that's going to be a work in progress. The one thing that's clear to me, I mean, it was clear in every job I've had, but is particularly clear working in the technology industry is, you know, you have to get used to the idea of change. And, you know, kind of there is, the, the organization is 
you know, next year going to be different than it is at, at another point in time. So it almost makes, you know, kind of the, the softer skills, you know, like communication, like that Dean just mentioned, even more important, right? So like there are, there are certain hard skills you need for certain periods of time, but broadly you need a range of skills to deal with a range of, you know, kind of contingencies. One of the things that I've always loved about our field is that people come from a really wide range of backgrounds. You know, I mentioned, you know, Gary Langer, whom I worked for at ABC News, he always loved to tell people that he has a BA in English. You know, he's very good and has a BA in English. There are people who have, you know, PhDs in political science. There are people increasingly who have, you know, kind of more data science-y hard skills. I think we benefited as a profession from having all of that and will continue to. So I don't think it's one thing over the other. I think you need some of everything. It's how the teams come together and how the teams grow. The challenge at some of the places I've worked is like, well, what if that has to be in one person? You only have one role. And then it gets really hard and difficult. But you know, okay, that's why we wanna make this more valuable for everyone so we can have teams that have all of those things. So not one thing, Bob, sorry, not an easy answer, but it's just kind of, there's something intangible that you need to pull together, making a good team. Great. Um, this is a, this is kind of a loaded topic, and I, I was trying to figure out the best way to answer to ask this question because I think it would depend on I don't want to say the age of the of the uh, person, but Bob, was, we're so, all here to judge how you ask the question. Oh, good. I'm going to ask it as 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 I don't want to say, in in the sort of hipster way it came to me, which is we all mentioned the topic about the future of polling, and it's like a whole topic. I mean, we could have a whole conference about the future of polling, but if you had to tweet. The future of polling. So you're limited in the number of characters you could say. What would the things that you either of you would say the future of polling is, and then you had to keep it to a certain number of characters or less? I'm gonna start with you, Mark. Gosh, you know, I I just think there's just a couple of basic things that would probably be common, but I think the method or just the data collection methods would vary all over the lot. Uh, you know, certainly. Sampling is important. Uh, and then I honestly believe, especially with the work I'm now doing, uh, the waiting, you have to adjust. I mean, when I first started in this industry, when we weighted the data, it was very, very similar to the unweighted data. I mean, I didn't really need weights in the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s. There's no way in the world you could do a poll without uh, uh, post stratification weighting. I, I don't believe what whatever method you use, you have to do this, and that to me is the is the future. Uh, you have to model things very well, and then uh, I think your survey will be reflected. You went over the tweet limit. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not but, a tweeter. I'm not even on Twitter, so that's that's. Oh my point. gosh. Well, uh, um, I would say the future of polling is not the past, so get over it and help shape what's next. Nice. Right, Dean? Representative and cheap. No. Cost effective. Let's be, you know, oh. cost effective. No, we need bigger teams. We need more expensive, Dean. Don't, well, don't not, not the money that we're spending ourselves. I'm talking about the cost of, of actually oh. doing the survey. Not everyone has their own company that they can just, you know, have a billion data points a, a week, you know. Yeah, and, and nor do we have to wait that much, Mark. But anyway, that's not about us. Next. Are there any any questions in the group? So one of the things I'd like to add to this is, you know, this is my third time talking to nine, you know, leaders in public opinion research, and consistently, the message I see is life is not linear. That you know what what you think you're going to do, and and this is always a joke. I thought you know I grew up in marketing research. I never thought I'd be involved in marketing research. And just the, the path that you take in life is very, it has its twists and turns. And uh, that's one key point that it, it just consistently comes around from everyone who we, we interview here. And the, this, the second one I wanna just emphasize for the group is the importance of 360, of the things in your life. There's a lot of talk about parenting and grandparenting and, the, and sports and getting out and seeing the outdoors. And um, in days, I personally had a moment where I was very, very focused on growing my business and I was not focusing on that other sort of 270 of my life and uh, had a, you know, had a, a sort of life-changing moment on that. And I just, I just love 
being in good company on this where others are similar things. Important to get out and golf for both for your physical, but also for your mental and your spiritual as well. And so um, that's just that. I just want to thank the three of you guys for uh, your, sharing your story. Appreciate that. And I'm going to hand it over to Aaron, who's going to bring us into our Paw Poor Happy Me Hour. I've been dying to say that. So thank you, Aaron. 